Hey, Erica and Mia uh, and the rest of the class. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to come and talk to you about uh, professional learning. Um, my name is Mike Muir, and I like to joke that I've had one job and just had different folks pay me for that job. And that job has been to figure out how to make schools work better uh, for all students. And I've been a recovering high school math teacher, uh, an early technology integrator, a teacher educator, um, an educational developer, uh, multiple pathways director in a district where we helped implement um, a couple of technology and proficiency-based learning projects. I just spent two years as the main learning through technology director and the director of their uh, statewide one-to-one -one initiative. And I'm currently with Gear Up Maine as a proficiency-based education specialist. And Gear Up Maine is um, Maine's federal grant award, part of the Gear Up Project, which works with um, schools with a high percentage of low-income students um, uh, to increase the percent of those students who actually go on to some form of post-secondary education. Uh, and I, uh, I will post, I have not yet posted, I will post to studentlearning.guru if you click on workshop resources there will be some links related to tonight's talk. Um, I don't have that ready for you at the moment, but I'll also put that link in the um, document that lists all of the uh, presenters from class, and I'll, I'll include that link with resources. But if you go to Student Learning Guru and click on Workshop Resources, you can see some of the other kinds of work that I do. So uh, one of my big interests is how do you make large-scale school change happen? And in order to make that happen, uh, you have to pay very close attention to training and supporting classroom teachers. Um, and so uh, some of the initiatives I've been involved in include the Maine Learning Technology Initiative. It is still the only one-to-one -one statewide learning with technology initiative. From 2001, all of our seventh and eighth grade students have had some sort of a device, a laptop or a, or a tablet, uh, all the students and the teachers. And we've expanded the program so that uh, grade levels and uh, other grade levels can buy in on the district's dime and take advantage of the buying power. And we've got uh, 376 schools involved, about 66,000 seats, student seats. That represents um, uh, roughly a third of the students in the state of Maine. And uh, uh, it does not count all of the districts that have done one-to-one -one on their own without help from MLTI. Um, uh, we've really helped make the state technology rich. When I was in Auburn Public Schools, we started the first um, uh, uh, literacy and math initiative with iPads in the country, one-to-one -one grades kindergarten through third grade. We've got research that showed when we did a good job with PD and the teachers did a good job implementing what we taught them in the, in the professional development, that we had an improvement in learning among our students. Um, and uh, I've also been involved in districts uh, on their efforts for proficiency-based education, something we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, today and exactly what it is. And then also you saw from my title that I'd be talking about proficiency-based uh, professional learning and what that looks like. So let's think for a minute about some of the needs from professional learning. Um, and these are probably, they're partially based on research, but they probably match what you've experienced in your own district if you're an educator. Uh, the challenge for schools is really there are so many initiatives and there are so few workshop days and there are very few uh, tech integrators and learning coaches. And um, the, uh, uh, it makes it really hard to implement anything that you're being asked to do in the classroom. A lot of districts are really good about providing resources, but the real problem is, is that if you don't know how to use them, it doesn't matter how many you have, it won't be much help. I love this cartoon is showing the real challenge of having resources, but not being trained in how to use them well. And I fully believe that if we are going to make these uh, uh, changes to school and to our classrooms, we certainly are doing them because we believe they're beneficial. 
And if so, then we have a moral obligation to support the heck out of teachers. Doubly so, given that there are so many um, initiatives right now that reflect uh, uh, classroom practices that are different from anything a teacher ever experienced themselves as a learner. And so we have to pay very close attention to uh, supporting them and helping them uh, to implement these things. I, I would go as far to say that it is um, educational malpractice to ask teachers to implement things that we've not adequately supported them to implement. So a, re a recent study around teachers and professional learning uh, pointed to 99% participate in formal PD, often required PD by their district, with a 20% satisfaction rate. <laughs> that does not sound really good. Uh, however, almost three quarters of those same teachers participate in non-required PD with a very high satisfaction rate. Now, I think that may mean that we're not paying close attention to why teachers participate in the informal PD and what they like about it. I think that with some changes, we could make the required PD as good. In theory, we're doing a required PD because we want to support teachers in a change that we value for some reason. Um, so we really have got to figure out what is it that teachers want and how we can do uh, what it, uh, how we can make the learning uh, uh, work better for teachers. So uh, another recent study looked at what teachers want. They want opportunities to learn skills and hone existing ones, especially those that they think will help them in their classroom right now. Um, they uh, want recognition and uh, sharing of best practices or good practices. Uh, they want it tailored to uh, individual teachers' needs. And they want validation of specific competencies, not seat time. I, I want you to know what I know and can do. I, I don't care that you know how long I attended something. So we clearly need something more than just workshops. And in fact, um, workshops, I think, are a critical piece of how we provide that support to teachers. But I think we've largely misunderstood them. I think we've thought that if we offer a workshop and the teacher is there, poof, we're done. They're able to implement this new strategy that we value. And um, I think it, that it comes from really misunderstanding the role of workshops, uh, that we miss out on the potential of uh, 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 getting the most out of them that we possibly can. And so I argue that we need to reframe professional learning to be proficiency-based. So let's start by talking a little bit about what is proficiency-based education. You may or may not be working in a school that's working on this. Um, and it goes by a lot of different names, mass customized learning, standards-based education, customized learning, proficiency-based learning, um, uh, personalized mastery. There's a lot of different names for this. Maine actually has a proficiency-based learning law that uh, within the next couple of years, all diplomas awarded uh, need to be uh, uh, proficiency-based instead of course-based. And Maine's definition, I, I pulled right from the website, but it really boils down to that it's based on students or think learners, in the case of adult learners, demonstrating mastery of the knowledge and skills that you're expecting them to learn. And um, the truth of the matter is, is that it can be an enormously powerful approach to teaching and learning, but it really is a different set of strategies than how we've often taught in schools, where we simply present material. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of the same strategy used, but how they're used and in what sequence and what other strategies are leveraged makes a difference. I really think proficiency-based education, by whatever name you're going to call it, boils down to two core beliefs. One is that people learn in different time frames and in, and in different ways. Um, and if we, if we understand these two things and recognize them and start thinking about, well, how would you structure a system of learning that recognize that people learn in different time frames in different ways? What might it look like? Because everything else flows from those two uh, beliefs. So one of the really big ideas is that we would be moving from the traditional, which has time as the constant, 
and learning is the variable. And uh, we think of kind of a typical high school classroom where um, uh, the teacher sets the pace of how you're moving through topics. Uh, you, uh, often in the textbook, remember I'm a recovering high school math teacher and that's my primary view of um, what high schools are often like. And so the learning is variable. Some kids will learn it and some kids won't. I think this is a lot like um, thinking about a train. So a train is leaving on a schedule and the learners are the passengers and they're either on the train or they're not on the train. But what becomes important, what you value is the train schedule, not how many learners arrive. So what you're really looking at is the pacing and did you cover everything? And what you're not paying as much attention to is how many kids learned it. So the new version under proficiency base is learning is the constant and time is the variable. And remember, we recognize that people learn in different ways in different time frames. So this is more like we've got a whole bunch of Ubers uh, set up in a row, ready to head to the new destination. And as soon as we've got a group of learners that are ready to leave, we throw them into one car and send it on its way. And then the next car pulls up. And as soon as the next group of learners come, uh, we throw them in the next car and send it on its way. And so what's important is the number of learners who arrive at the designation, not so much uh, uh, the schedule. Now, clearly these are metaphors meant just to get you thinking about those two differences. It is not the case that we don't care about the schedule. We do. Um, but it, it's about structuring things so we're caring more about how many kids arrive and less about um, do they all arrive on the same day or not. To tell you the truth, we've seen PBE before. If any of you have been Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and looking at the names, I think most of you have had the opportunity to be Girl Scouts. Um, the merit badge system is really, and, and even um, of achieving the uh, various rank is a proficiency-based system where you have to do certain things and demonstrate uh, that you know certain things and demonstrate that you can do certain things. Uh, but not everybody has to do them at the same time. Uh, but you get recognized for them and you can move forward. And to tell you the truth, it's how most professionals do it now. If you are in the military and want to be a sergeant, then you take the sergeant's exam when you're ready for it. And granted, the exam may only be offered so often, but if you don't pass it the first time, you can take it a second time or a third time. If you want to be a real estate agent, if you want to be a lawyer, uh, you demonstrate your mastery. If you don't succeed the first time, you can do it again. It's how we all got our driver's licenses. So if we're going to rethink uh, 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 professional learning, so that it's going to be proficiency based, then we need to think about what are the categories of actions, resources, uh, what do we have to put into place uh, uh, if we want to be proficiency based. And so one of those categories is going to be clarity. What are the strategies that we want teachers to know? And one of them will be how do we provide support for foundational knowledge? How will they learn the basics and be introduced to these new strategies? But remember, we don't want them just to attend a workshop. We want them to actually have these strategies and use them in their classroom. So what kinds of supports are we going to put into place for approaching proficiency? So these are the categories we're going to look at now. So let's think about clarity. One component of that is that we have a professional learning curriculum. What is it that we want teachers to know and be able to do? So depending on what your initiative is, and I'm gonna see if I can make that picture better. There we go. Um, this is a plain English instructional model that we used for a while with schools to get them thinking about having any kind of instructional model beyond simply um, uh, uh, teaching foundational knowledge out of a textbook. And uh, the nice thing about it is it's not meant to replace any other instructional model you might have. If you use Marzano or Danielson or Hattie, it will be a very short crosswalk to this. But it's this idea that in order for a student to really learn material, uh, we need some strategies to show them the foundational knowledge. 
there's strategies for practice and deepening understanding, but then we need opportunities for put them uh, for their putting the knowledge to work. Uh, Project-based learning, focus on complex reasoning, and we want all of those to be have an ongoing interaction with assessment and evidence and feedback, especially with a really good um, uh, continuous improvement model. And then I don't know about you guys, but schools in Maine still have kids who aren't motivated all the time. And so you have to have uh, uh, all of this within the context of creating the conditions for students to be self-motivated. So this might be the professional learning curriculum around certain learning initiatives. Uh, you'll notice that there's an overview. I'm going to, again, I'm going to try and make that picture better. This was a uh, 12 professional learning buckets for learning through technology that we used at the main department of education. We said that we didn't just want teachers to be able to use the tools. We wanted them to be able to leverage tools for learning. And so you'll notice that there is already tech for foundational knowledge, tech for practice and deepening understanding, tech for putting knowledge to work. There's also a tech for assessment and evidence of feedback and student motivation and engagement. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure teachers had some classroom management strategies besides just taking the device away or sending a kid to the principal, that we all needed to teach digital citizenship. We need to keep track of student learning and help kids be independent and connect with home. Uh, so this was our professional learning curriculum around learning through technology. And this one's a little hard to read, but this was our, um, when I was in Auburn, this was our professional learning curriculum for customized learning, which was the version of uh, proficiency-based learning uh, or competency-based learning that we were focused on. Um, and you might notice that we took the, the point of view that um, uh, we didn't want people worrying about learning everything at once. And our belief was break it into phases so that a teacher only had to learn what uh, the skills and strategies were that the phase they were in now. And so we would have, for example, as we had teachers finishing up the classroom culture phase, as they were ready, we would offer them a workshop that would get them into the instructional design phase. But we would still have teachers that were working on classroom culture that did not take that workshop. So we didn't just say, you know, it's the spring workshop day, so everybody's gonna get the instructional design phase. And in fact, we would have a handful of teachers that were way ahead and they were in the instructional implementation phase and they were getting a different kind of training. Um, and then we would have maybe some new people to the district. And so they were just getting the awareness training or they were getting the classroom culture training um, to move forward. So it, it um, broke things up into, into a nice little step-by-step -step process. It freed teachers to not worry about things. Um, but this was our professional learning curriculum. So the big idea here is that for your initiative, big or small, you have a way to define what the strategies are um, that you want those teachers to learn and that they're named and out there somewhere. Uh, another piece of clarity is, there we go, um, uh, professional learning progress management system. How are you gonna keep track of, the, of what skills the teachers have? How are we gonna manage this? And so some places are using, there we go. I'm finding, I don't know if everybody sees this, but sometimes when I change, I have two devices right now, one where I'm just a participant and one where I'm sharing my screen. And uh, if it doesn't show up well as a participant, I try to make, clarify the screen. So that's why sometimes it looks like it's jumping around a bit. I'm anyway, also, educate is a- I'm, I'm posting the slides too in our course um, so that people can get them as okay, well. Okay, good. Good, good. So Educate is a, a learning progress management system that a lot of districts that are doing personalized learning is using. And uh, uh, the school can put their own set of learning targets in there. Well, the program only cares about learners and learning targets and what evidence you have of having learned it. So it works just as well as a professional learning um, uh, management system. You just put in the professional learning targets and teachers can keep track of what they're doing. One advantage to doing this, for example, is that teachers would be managing their own learning on the same system where they would be managing their students' learning. Another approach might be micro-credentials, digital badging. 
Digital Promise, for example, has a very broad selection, a couple hundred different um, educator micro-credentials. And just like scouting badges, there's a very clearly defined small set of knowledge and skill that you need to have, a clear definition of what you have to demonstrate in order to earn it. And you submit your evidence when you're ready, someone reviews your evidence, and then they either provide you feedback for how to get closer to earning the badge, or they sign off and, and you get the badge. Um, so there's different ways you want some way to keep track of and provide recognition for the strategies teachers learn. That's all about the learning progress management system. The third component of clarity is, but what does it look like? I don't know if any of you have ever heard this before, but people ask the question a lot about, uh, but what does it look like in, in, uh, with kids my age? What does it look like in math class? Um, I get what you're telling me, but what does it look like with kids just like mine? Um, and so we have to find ways to answer this question. It might include visiting classrooms. It might include uh, a large collection of, of videos. Um, it might include field trips. Uh, but we have to be cognizant, especially in the case where this is new to teachers, they're going to wonder what it looks like. And if we can proactively help answer those questions, um, it lowers their blood pressure, makes them feel like they can learn it even makes them feel like it matches uh, uh, something that they're able to do, that they could do themselves. So there we go. So for clarity, we have three components, the professional learning curriculum, professional learning progress management system, and answering the question, but what does it look like? So let's move on to support for foundational knowledge. This is actually where workshops come in, but workshops where we don't think of them as once you do them, you're done, and you're proficient, you should be able to do this in your class. Instead, we think of them as same page sessions. They're introductory, they teach you some how-to, they introduce you to the vocabulary we're gonna use, so we then have a shared vocabulary about the work that we're doing. Um, and it, 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 it's the launching pad to prepare them to get good at this strategy. So uh, workshops are still a critical piece of this um, uh, model but we have to really think wisely about where they fit. This may not be a lot different than the conversation we're having about textbooks. I don't think textbooks are inherently bad. I think textbooks are bad when we think they are the curriculum. And when we back off and say, well, what is the role of a textbook and how do I use it well for that role? It's the same thing as here. What's the role of a workshop and how do we use it well? Um, in addition to the kinds of face-to-face -face workshops that we're used to, uh, we can also explore using reusable learning objects. So that could include recorded webinars. Some of you are listening to me now after Monday evening, and this is technically a reusable learning object because uh, people can use it at different times and when they're ready. It might be a website, it might be a digital resource, it might be a video, um, but it essentially serves the same purpose as the same page uh, session. Uh, uh, but rather than being live, it is something that's recorded in digital that uh, people can use in their own time. So those are the two components of the uh, support for foundational knowledge. This is how we teach the teachers the basics of the new strategy. But the really important piece is recognizing that where we've often fallen short is in not providing for teachers to approach proficiency. How are we going to help them get good at these strategies? How are we not gonna just introduce them and then say, go to it, you're on your own? And um, some of those strategies include that we recognize that lesson invention and tryouts is actually professional learning. So when I go back to my classroom and I try what you just taught me in a workshop, that's a lesson invention and I'm trying it out. And it needs to be okay to not go perfect the first time. But combined with not going perfect the first time, I should reflect on um, how could it do better next time? Uh, how, what do I learn from it not working well the first time that can make it better? This kind of reflective practice. In fact, if teachers don't practice the strategy shortly after the workshop, they'll often uh, lose that skill and, and miss out on becoming good at it. 
but we can't expect teachers to walk out of the workshop and suddenly be good at it. We've got to give them a chance to try it out. Combined with that, let me get the screen. There we go, is teachers need some sort of coaching and feedback. Now, at times, it can be informal by colleagues. So it might be a teacher who drops into your room and helps share with you some good ideas. But it might also sometimes be a professional coach, a literacy coach, a learning coach, a instructional coach, a tech integrator. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is if your initiative involves strategies that are very different and new from what teachers are used to, you really need a professional coach. What, for example, if teachers are implementing proficiency-based education and you want them to implement some of the strategies that are different from the uh, traditional forms of teaching, you really need someone who A, knows those strategies well, and B, can work actively to build trust with the individual teachers. So because so much of the coaching is about modeling the new, new strategy, uh, uh, co-teaching the new strategy, letting the teacher try it out and you and the coach provides feedback. And with strategies that are really different from what teachers are used to, colleagues are well-intentioned, but what they will reinforce are the traditional skills, not the new skills. Not only that, coaching is probably the single most important component of a professional learning system for a new strategy that's a paradigm shift for teachers. So if you're going to do learning through technology, if you're going to do proficiency-based education, you probably need a really good learning coach. Frankly, if you're a, a maybe a low-income school that doesn't have a lot of support, so you don't really have a strong literacy curriculum and you're really struggling on teaching kids um, with um, uh, literacy, you need a good literacy coach to bring those strategies for, for teachers. So it doesn't just have to be the new and different. It just has to be the new and different to that teacher. Um, and this piece is really critical. In fact, all the pieces of uh, uh, providing supports for proficiency are really critical. So the uh, last component under supports for teachers getting to proficiency is teacher face-to-face -face time. So this one is really important because uh, teachers who are trying the same thing, if you can put them in the same room, they can discuss successes and challenges in a way that makes them feel like they're not alone. And, and I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen a teacher who had tried things, was frustrated, was angry, had their arms crossed, and was telling people about how it didn't work. And another teacher said, huh, you know, I, I tried the same thing, but this is what I did. Did you try that? It worked for me, and you kind of see the other teacher relax and their arms uncross, and they go, well, maybe I'll give that a shot. Not only that, their peers have enormous credibility, more than a, a curriculum director does or a principal, um, and, uh, or for that matter, a coach who has not yet built a trusting relationship with that teacher. Um, and so the peer response can be really helpful in moving things along. So the key components, and I'm waiting for the screen to catch up. There we go. So the key components for uh, supporting uh, teachers approaching proficiency and getting good at the new strategies include the lesson invention and tryouts, the coaching and feedback, and the teacher face-to-face -face time. And here's the full model for proficiency-based professional learning. Do you have a way to make it clear what you want teachers to know. And if your system is big and complex enough, are you gonna, how are you going to keep track of their learning? Um, if, if you're, excuse me, I'm going to cough for a second and try not to blow your ears out. <coughs> Sorry about that. If, um, if you're trying something smaller like makerspace, you might still just break it down into two or three or four key strategies. You might not need a full-blown learner progress management system but you probably still want some way to define them for your teachers and help your teachers know what they look like. You're gonna want some sort of a foundational approach, whether that's some reusable learning objects or a workshop. But it's really important too that you still make sure, large or small, you're finding ways for teachers to try out this new strategy, to get some feedback, and to talk with other teachers who are trying some of the same things. So this is the 
This is the idea of proficiency-based professional learning. And that brings us to an opportunity for you folks to ask your questions. And in fact, I think what I'm gonna do is turn off uh, screen sharing if I can. And um, so we can go back to looking at one another. Yeah, um, I know Laura has a question. Um, I'm gonna jump in here and then let everybody else um, follow me, but um, so there's some really concrete strategies here, I think that will be applicable to whatever they design down the road. So this is great. This is spot on and just what we need, Mike, thank you. Um, you mentioned in the last slide, um, professional learning progress management system. Is that a tool? Is that something that exists, that software that people have made or? Yeah, it exists in a couple of different forms. Uh, um, the uh, uh, Educate is one program that's out there. Um, any of the student learning progress management systems like Jump Rope or any of those could, you could substitute professional learning, um, uh, uh, learning objectives instead of core curriculum objectives and then uh, monitor the teacher progress with them. So it, it's not a lot different than any of the grade books. Uh, and then the other way that folks are starting to do it is through micro-credentials. And there is software for micro-credentials. Uh, Bloomboard is, a, is a, probably one of the largest, uh, for, uh, especially for professionals that want to earn micro-credentials. Uh, but Credly, and there are others, uh, so yes, there is software to help. Am I mute on both systems? No. No, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, good. Yeah, good. We, the, um, 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 I'm happy to welcome another person into the webinar tonight. We have Terry Cullen, who is a professor at Oklahoma uh, University of Oklahoma, and she's here in Ireland with me, not in my hotel, but she's going to the same conference that I am. So welcome, Terry. And Terry, by the way is another Apple Distinguished Educator, and Mia, maybe, I know Mia is very interested in the ADE program, so maybe we can, we can chat about that at some point, but um, there was a reason I was saying, so anyway, Terry and I were talking earlier today about micro-credentialing, and she's been using Badge List, which people might wanna look at, which is about, it's, a, it's two guys that have developed this, that they have doctorates in assessment from UC Santa Cruz, I believe. Um, and we use that for our global ed conference, but we've also used, um, and incredibly, I've, I've played around with Credly before. We also use something called Chrome Warrior. And I want to say for one of my classes last year, and I don't know if it was the summer one or the, um, the previous TIE 575, we used um, Chrome Warrior, which is now called Aludo Learning. And it's a gamified um, yep. way of so, setting things up. It took a lot of work to get things going, but it's, it's, it's an interesting platform. So the one thing that you should make sure of is no matter what you're using for micro-credentials, that the platform is, call, is something called Open Badges Compliant. Mm -hmm. um, because the power of micro-credentials is it doesn't matter where you earn them or who you earn them from, you should still be able to share them and collect them. And um, uh, if a system is not Open Badges Compliant, you can only share your uh, items within that system. And, uh, and so, Terry, I'm wondering if badge list is open badges uh, compliant. Do you know? It is, actually. Um, so that's the reason that we used it is um, I'm, I'm using it with pre-service teachers. And, um, and I just gave a list to the course that's about to open. And I should give you an old one. But one of the things that I liked is that um, every time someone posts something, they can give a direct link to their own um, to their own content. So if yes. they want to portfolio, want to portfolio it, um, they can link into their content that way. Um, another thing that is not open badge compliant, I don't think, uh, actually I'm 99% I'm sure. So I went to badge summit last year, right before ISTE, which is Noah Giesel's, um, yes. badging, um, group. And I have to say really probably one of my best experiences in a long time and I think that's where um, badging is really important 
Uh, what I was going to say about that is um, uh, I talked to a lot of the different companies, but one of their sponsors was Participate, um, is trying this business model where they're allowing teachers to create, I, I want to con say create a story, where they're gathering the different things that they're doing on their own to create kind of a, kind of a portfolio. It's, it's a little clunky yet. But the idea is if you participate in a, um, a chat, the chats are archived there. So you can include that in like your profile. Oh, cool. And so they're selling their product to schools to allow teachers to create kind of their story of their own independent professional learning, um, which is, is very interesting. And, and I'm hopeful for it, but I don't see it as being open. I think you have to be a member or your school has to subscribe to use it. The, um, it's possible that... Uh, they are still open badges compliant, even if there is a subscription model. Um, but Terry, it sounds like uh, you and I have a lot to talk about sometime. I hope Lucy will connect us. Um, I was had a hard time making up my mind whether I was gonna present on proficiency-based professional learning or whether I was gonna present on um, educator micro-credentials. So um, I, I would be interested in hearing more about what you're doing with pre-service teachers. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. I think it's I think it's a good thing. Although I will say that the hardest part of all of this kind of thing is making the sell and right. explaining, especially for pre-service teachers, is making sure everyone understands um, that what where's the benefit to this, and if and and how is this better than just going to a, to a regular professional development or something like that. So you'd be interested to know that um, Maine uh, Department of Education Division of Certification is interested in our work around micro-credentials because they're, uh, at some point, they recognize that it potentially could be a different path to certification. Mm -hmm. um, it still might involve higher ed, but rather than a training, in script, you would have a collection of micro credentials, and uh, uh, so anyway, there, I, we sold we sold the idea recently on micro credentials uh, actually to the educate developers when we told them that LinkedIn was open badges compliant, so professionals could share their micro credentials, and for them that's what um, changed their mind. They always viewed the program as not just being a student learning management system, but also national learning management system. And when they found that out, they decided to make sure that it was um, uh, open badges compliant. And they're in the process of that work right now. So you're right. It's a new enough idea that you still have to sell it. Uh, but there's a couple of places like the Digital Promise program and LinkedIn that help people see that, that maybe it's more than just a gimmick. Laura, do you want to ask your question? And um, then Terry, you also had another question about um, some of the research behind what's, what, uh, <coughs> sorry, what Mike was saying. I'll give the mic to Laura. Laura, why don't you ask your question? Do I understand that so many technology in schools uh, is a $60 billion a year hoax. And so I made a slide this summer that said that this year Time Magazine followed up with an article about construction industry and that hammers were a $60 billion a year um, hoax. And, and it had a fake uh, contractor saying, I threw them in the building. The building isn't done yet. And I think that's what we see in a lot of schools is that they think having or owning the technology is what's going to improve the learning. And that's not the case at all. 
in Maine, one of the things we did was we changed the tech plan that each district had to do every three years into the main learning technology plan. They had to start by putting together a group of stakeholders, come to agreement on a vision for learning, not a vision for technology and not a vision for school, but a vision for learning. What kinds of learning experiences did you want to have your kids have? And then a three-year plan on how you were going to achieve that. In fact, that plain English instructional model, the one that just had uh, foundational knowledge, practice and deepening understanding, putting knowledge to work, uh, assessment and feedback, and attending to student motivation, grew out of that work. Um, what we're seeing even in Maine is that 15 years after we started MLTI, many of our schools are stuck at just doing word processing, presenting, and online research. And that isn't necessarily a way to justify this kind of work. So you have to tie how you use the technology to some sort of a learning model, even a simple one like the one I shared, and then train your teachers in how to use technology in different ways. Um, the screen time issue is an interesting one. And what I'm going to do is go to the research that's coming out now for uh, primary grades kids, K through three. And um, uh, there is a lot of research that says screen time is bad for kids, but one thing that even the, the um, AMA has changed in recent years is recognizing that there are different kinds of screen time. And in fact, if you look at the, um, oh, and I forget the acronym, but it's the Association for Educators of Young Children or something like that, um, they, the, their position paper recognizes that um, there is lean forward screen time, which is the active learning, and lean back screen time, which is the passive learning. And with young children, young learners, they recommend avoiding the passive learning. What you want is active learning, like creation, and, um, and primary grade kids can do that. One of our first lessons uh, when we were working on the iPad initiative in Auburn uh, with our kindergartners was that we knew a lot we figured out pretty quickly a lot of ways to help kids build foundational knowledge, but we had to bring in help uh, to help us see what kinds of apps and strategies could we use in the classroom uh, to help build conceptual understanding of mathematics. And all, almost always, it was a combination of um, it was a combination of teacher actions and the tools. Um, and so I don't, I, I frankly see the same thing in middle schools in Maine, where we have teachers that just have kids search the internet or don't use the technology for learning, but during homework time, they can do what they want. We really need to do uh, good training around good instruction and include as part of that good instruction, the kinds of technology tools that will help them with those instructional strategies. Um, so I would argue that we don't want to, uh, we want to be cautious of deciding if technology is good or bad just because we see things that don't seem to have a lot of impact happening in classrooms and instead think about um, productive and counterproductive uses of technology and do everything we can in our schools, the schools that our children attend and the schools that we teach at to try and build the capacity of teachers to use the technology in, in productive ways and to avoid using it for counterproductive ways. Thank you, I, I totally agree with that. And I think probably my biggest fear has to do with, I have seen a lot of technology misuse and I do know that there are definitely benefits to um, using the tools, but, uh, but again, the training really has to be there. And, I just know we don't have enough of it and um, and you know coming from a world where we are I mean we're addicted to our phones where you know myself included I just I, I do everything I can as as a parent to try and avoid that as long as I can you know at least until until we get to grade school um, just because I know the world that my kids are going going into so anyway thank you so much for your thoughts I appreciate that yeah you bet Terry, thanks for sharing those resources while I was talking. I sure. Have a question, Mike. Um, when you were talking about, uh, you know, kind of the framework for how professional learning could take place, 
do you think that a way it could be viewed as sort of like a curriculum for teacher development during the school year that the principal could kind of view it that way? Because I'm trying to think of how could this idea be explained to others that would be manageable and approachable and familiar? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That, that is exactly what I'm saying, that this, it becomes the teacher's curriculum. Um, and that, that uh, but not just that it becomes their curriculum, but that we recognize that we have to support it by showing them what it looks like, teaching them the basics, and helping them get good at it. Thank you. I was just typing that response down. I didn't want the click of my keyboard to um, disturb anyone. So thank you. I appreciate that. So have any of you, I'm curious, um, Mia, Erica, and Laura, have any of your PD experiences reflected some of the principles that Mike talked about? I mean, Erica, you were talking about your responsive classroom PD that you recently took. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so basically, um, I was just looking into going to responsive classroom um, PDs recently. And I really wanted to take one on like misbehavior. I forget what the title was, but they wouldn't allow me to because you have to take like the introduction workshop first. So it kind of seems like they have a ladder, like an order that they want you to take their workshops. And part of me thinks, yes, it's just to like get people's money, but also I think it makes sense to kind of start with the introductory level and then do the add-ons later it was i just kind of saw some similarities with that i i think you're right i um i think we're always suspicious of anything that costs educators money and whether folks are just trying to earn money but um responsive classroom is one of those organizations that uh has a pretty good educational reputation so I suspect they're just being thoughtful about um, learning sequences for the teachers involved. Um, I wanted to add something about participate. Um, so last quarter or the, last summer we had, I had all the students um, curate collections of uh, on various tools in participate's platform um, so that we had a way of looking at each other's um, resources that we accrued and people could then grab something from somebody else's collection and put it into theirs um, and I'm not sure and so that's one thing that they do they also do this Twitter chat tool uh, but then their platform they have a new thing called PD portal which I guess must be what Terry is talking about and you can integrate all these different components into it and just to clarify, um, <clears throat> somebody in, in the course evaluation over the summer had concerns about this because I think they, A, they didn't like being mandated to use a certain platform for curation. Um, I was just trying to provide a common space for everybody. And, and B, in all transparency, participate in the sponsor of my global ed stuff. And that aside, I still think it's a, a really interesting tool and they're doing some really interesting things and trying to innovate in this space. So I just want to make sure I was transparent about that uh, in case anybody had concerns. And, and Terry, it's interesting that you brought it up without me prompting. Um, I think they're doing some interesting things. And um, the Badge Summit piece, um, they did this the, the Saturday before ISTE, everyone. So I'm guessing that they'll probably do it again this year if you're interested. Right the micro credentialing stuff you know um, I put the link in the chat earlier um, from last year keep an eye on that and I bet they'll announce some sort of event soon prior to ISTE um, I talked to Noah recently just just and yes they've got a location already it's always off-site someplace probably it'll be a little more suburby um, in order to reduce the cost and that they are committed to doing it again this year. And I would say that um, if there's people that you follow in your PLN and your professional learning network that are doing badging, there was some people like Shell Terrell and um, Sarah Thomas 
and a couple other people in kind of like the teacher sphere and social media who are really committed to this idea. It was a really great opportunity to just sit down and have a conversation from people who are using it in the schools now. I, I found it really valuable. It was my biggest disappointment about not being able to go to ISTE this year because I thought I was going and then I wasn't. Are you going to come this year? Of course, because it's in Chicago. I, I, unfortunately, no. I, I'm having a harder. It was easy to connect to my job as uh, learning through technology director for the state of Maine. Harder to connect to my job as PDE specialist for Gear Up Maine. Okay. Too bad. It's it's going to be glorious because it's in our hometown. I know. Um, I know. I know. Um, and it would be great for you to meet people in person too. Um, I'm wondering, Mike, too, if you have any advice. Um, you know, everybody is, is going to be in the next couple of weeks kind of figuring out what interests them in terms of staff development and what and, and identifying some sort of need in their school based on current initiatives in their school. Um, I'm wondering, is there any kind of practical tips beyond what you've given us today in terms of the design and um, maybe the assess, how do you assess teachers' needs in your, in your building? How do you know what they need? Uh, you, you've referred to that. Maybe I missed it, but is there some sort of secret sauce or tool or methodology that you would recommend? I, um, I, so Lucy, do we have another hour? The, uh, uh, I think I'll pass out if we have another hour. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I, it, it's gotta be what one or two that you're, uh, your time midnight. zone? It's almost midnight here. Yeah. And if Terry's up, if Terry can do this, I can do it. But I, I okay. don't last right. much longer. But out of curiosity, I think this might be helpful to, to everyone. Yeah, I, a couple of different things. Um, one is that um, um, start by thinking about what are the discrete skills a teacher needs in order to do something. And write those down. And then look at, is there a sequence that they need? Not necessarily a linear sequence, but is there something they really need to learn as A before they learn about B? And is there something D that they could learn in parallel that the sequence doesn't matter? Um, but always think, so that will tell you the key skills you want teachers to get as you begin to plan your PD. But it's always important to start your PD by giving teachers the big picture. What does this look like in action? You know, whether it's a video or an experience, you can give them a direct experience uh, that's just like the one you want them to create for kids and then deconstruct it for them. Um, but at, uh, the, where you start with planning is thinking about what are the individual skills that your teachers need in order to do this thing well. Um, and then in terms of assessment, uh, assessment of their skills, think about performance assessments, even if it means they share it with you a month later. Um, and, and think about how you might help them get good at it in the classroom uh, uh, over that time span. In terms of figuring out needs assessments, um, that one's harder. I, and, and for a lot of reasons, it, it really depends on the initiative. Um, in general, I found that if you ask teachers what they want training in, they tell you, you offer those workshops, and they don't come. Um, and uh, I think instead, if you ask them a question about what challenges do you have right now? What, what are you working on that's hard uh, or that's coming up that's hard? Those are the things that they really, that if you offer a workshop, they're likely to come. Um, if you are trying to implement a, a new initiative that's pretty new, like proficiency-based education, learning through technology, maker spaces, it pays off to talk to other places that are fairly successful at implementing it and find out what did they do and in what order um, that made sense. And if the initiative is complex at all, I really recommend breaking it down into phases. Um, and I'll share some resources about that. Um, but the, the um, uh, based on what teachers say who have successfully implemented it, I'll give you an example. 
uh, in, in the proficiency-based education work, we visited a high school that was farther ahead than our high school in implementing this work. And we were talking to an English teacher and, and one of the conventional wisdom was you started around some classroom culture pieces that especially focused on student voice and choice and clarity of the curriculum. And uh, this particular English teacher said, have, being a traditional English teacher, you know, I'm not sure why I would have kids do that. And she skipped it. And she went straight to the instructional strategies that were in the next phase of implementation. But she failed repeatedly in being able to implement them. She couldn't make them work, couldn't make them work. And what kept coming back were people saying, well, how'd you do with the voice and choice piece? How'd you do with the curriculum transparency piece? And so she finally decided to go back and do those pieces. And then when she did the instructional pieces after that with her kids, it started working. And so that was a big aha. And we figured we could learn proactively from the mistakes she had made. And we made sure that the voice and choice piece and the, and the curricular transparency came in our phases document before the classroom practice piece. So talk to other schools that are further along with the implementation and find out what worked and what didn't work to help inform uh, your work. If you're in a proficiency-based learning system, and if you have something like Empower, a software program like Empower, or if you're using micro-credentials, and if as a school or district leader, you have access to seeing which skills your teachers have, uh, and you've, you've got your curriculum laid out in a scope and sequence or a, or a set of phases, it becomes pretty easy to determine how many teachers need the next piece and how many teachers need the previous piece and how many teachers just need a coaching uh, piece to get better at what they're working on. Um, so there's a, I, like I said, there's a lot of different answers. I apologize. My stepson says to me all the time, Mike, you don't have a short answer for anything. Um, but uh, how you do a needs assessment really depends on the breadth and scope of the uh, work that you're doing. It may be for some of your, especially for the, for the uh, project for this class, you've simply chosen a high interest strategy that you're going to work with teachers in your district who are interested in it. And uh, for that, uh, selecting a high interest strategy may be how you design something of use rather than a needs assessment. And finally, one more final question. What has been, as a, as a learner yourself, what has been one of your favorite PDs that you've actually participated in as opposed to led? This is something that we've been discussing in our discussion forums this week. And I'm just curious, what, what has, has motivated you as a learner that you've attended before? I, I, so I would say it's nothing I quote unquote attended. Um, my best and favorite professional learning has happened when I've been um, part of a group where uh, my skill set has contributed well to the project, but I'm working with others who have complementary skills. And at the same time, I'm applying my expertise. I'm learning from them on how to apply these new skills. And because we're doing it for a real project, um, that's kind of like the lesson tryout thing where I get a chance to try things right away and see how they go and, and test them out. Um, I think a lot of my professional learning has been going from um, one opportunity where I brought some skills and shared them, but I learned some new skills and then my larger skill set was needed on another project, but I had other people there who taught me new skills and then that larger, larger, set of skills were needed on another project. So for me, it's all been about um, uh, opportunities to work on projects of interest and need to me personally, to my work, while working with folks that have additional expertise to share with me and expand my skill set. And you know what, I think a big part of that is um, it's respecting teachers as professionals to have that kind of um, reciprocal kind of vibe in a professional development experience. And I think that often um, some people aren't respectful of 
people's time or expertise or what they bring to the table. I think some people have an attitude that teachers need to be fixed as opposed to being empowered. I think that's my personal view. But, um, but uh, there's also classroom teachers bring the view that they don't have a voice and shouldn't have a voice. Um, Lucy okay. knows that my, my wife is the 2017 main teacher of the year. And one of the things that has been a big aha for her, especially as a dyed in the wool introvert, is to have a voice to share about the life of uh, her kids who come from challenging socioeconomic backgrounds um, and about the life of teachers in rural Maine. Um, and bringing that voice to legislatures and decision makers and committees. Um, teachers, yes, part of that respect is respecting your own voice and finding ways to bring it in respectful ways to advocate for teachers, your schools, and the kinds of kids you serve. That's the perfect ending, Mike. Good answer, good answer. All right. Um, hey, Lucy, I've got a technical question for you. Yeah. I haven't figured out a way to copy and save the chat. Under um, the right-hand side, yep. uh, you'll see a, um, a little pull-down menu that says um, right where you would type. Um, it says uh -huh. more. I see it. And you can save the chat. I believe also when I process the recording, it also saves a copy of the chat too. So what I'll do is I will, um, I'm going to post it, uh, it's midnight right now, probably in about five or six hours, I'll post it online for my class and I'll send you a copy of all this too. Great. And then I promised the class that I would do a resources um, post on Student Learning Guru. And as soon as I have that ready, um, Lucy, I'll email it to you. I'll okay. put it uh, into the um, uh, session list with the zooms and everything but I'll okay. also email it to you so you can email it to class okay. or include it in your documents or whatever. Wonderful I, I gave them the, the link to that and to your um, your other blog as well so um, awesome but I will, I'll make sure to get the updated link when you send that to me. Uh, it's always a treat to have you here Mike and I really appreciate it and uh, if there's anything that we can ever do for you please let us know and uh, Stay warm in Maine, and we'll talk to you soon. Terrific. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. Thanks, and thanks, Terry, for coming. I'll see you later, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, Bye -bye. everyone.